Welcome back to your San Diego Air and Space Museum. We're standing in front of the only true flying replica of the Spirit of St. Louis, originally built by T. Claude Ryan and a team here in San Diego. We're also joined by Charles Lindbergh. We're going to take you on a trip this evening down memory lane. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. We're so happy to have you with us. Join us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jim Kidrick, President and CEO of the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Welcome to the International Air and Space Hall of Fame Gala. Uh, here we are on the stage. Uh, uh, we're uh, minus a few people, of course, in front of us, uh, but we promise an absolute wonderful, wonderful evening. You notice that I'm looking around like there are people here. Uh, there we go. We've got clapping in the uh, background. I'm going to introduce now your MC for the evening, uh, the uh, chairman of the board of directors at the Air and Space Museum, Mr. Mark Larson. We're prohibited, actually, by, you know, on high, uh, for applauding too much and no singing. Can't do we have to make light of the situation a little bit because it's a very serious Virus thing we've all been living in since what March, can but we, we boo? also can we boo? We could boo, we could, but but at the same time, we you know, we need to do as much as we can to have a semblance of normalcy, and we will, and we do, and we're not going to let a year go by without saluting some of the great people who deserve to be and will be inducted into our museum. So so we do that, even if there's I see imaginary people out here. It's great. And well, and actually, we're probably, we're actually, feet, actually, we couldn't have gotten anyone better, okay, in San Diego than a radio talk show host who's kind of used to not having anyone here, oh, oh, that's okay? Right, that's and right. uh, you want to plug the show? You, don't, you normally plug where I work during my day job. Let me see. You were with 
AM 760. AM 760 radio. News. And a contributing. Contributor. Okay, AUSI. to uh, contributing whatever you contribute. All that stuff. Okay, which is uh, highly unlikely, but uh, all that. He's the political expertise, as he says, right. to uh, KUSI TV, TV and certainly chairman of our board, so I've got to be extremely careful. I'll, I'll be right over here. Are I back here now? You are? Okay. Shall I uh, intro the evening here? Well, I think it's time to go. What do you think? We ought to just leave. Well, should we wait until dinner is served, imaginary dinner? Well, dinner has been served. Oh, they, that's right. It's, well, sometimes we start and people are still getting into the desserts. Yes. So desserts, which we'll be getting after this, are just desserts. Well, this is, here's some of the things that are constant and immobile. And for me, and I think for all of us here at the museum, the staff, people behind the scenes, Jim Kidrick, of course, is our great president and CEO who is getting battle tested this year, along with the rest of the staff, in terms of how to keep things going here. And the fact that we are here, and so is this building, and so is this great collection, and this Hall of Fame, that's that's like an anchor to normalcy in the middle of these times where we all get up in the morning and go, I know we're all in this together, but what? I mean, some things never change. We're in the beautiful, historic 1935 Ford building. This is the Ford Motor Company building from the exposition back then. There were five buildings at Ford Pavilions, and various World's Fairs and expositions, and this is the only one that remains. So it's an Art Deco masterpiece, and, you know, it's, uh, and then, you know, Ford was done, then they drove away from it, and this sat here as a variety of, uh, it was like a storage during World War II, sort of a storage place, and, and then one thing led to another. We ended up moving here after the disastrous fire uh, back at the other location up in the Prado, and, you know, thank goodness, thank God that we've been here in a, what is not just a great masterpiece of a building, but an internationally renowned treasure chest of, of aviation space history, and not just to be history, but it's also about moving ahead, learning from the past, building on that, getting new generations. There's our flyover. Told them not to do that during dessert. Remember that, Jim? Just, you know, we tried the best, but again, everybody's been a little edgy. We, uh, we get that. So, Anyway, uh, I know a lot of people are here either in spirit or they're watching online. You know who you are, Lyndon Blue and Ronnie Blue out there, Ronnie Froman Blue. I mean, talk about a, uh, that, the two of them run the world, basically. Uh, he's got the Predators and everybody gets a free Predator. We're talking about the UAVs. To spy, well, you can use those now to make sure your neighbor's doing all the protocols with the, uh, now that we're in Covidian time. Uh, Harry and Linda Robins, uh, Robertson are here tonight. And the Robinsons may be here too. Swiss Family Robinson may be here. We could, Charles Lindbergh could be here tonight. Who knows? He is. Well, he's out there. We see him often. Uh, Bob and Sue Wilson, Hudson and Mary Drake, I see you back there, and uh, they're all in the Hall of Fame. Ron Roberts, uh, I know you're out there too, uh, county supervisor. Now, uh, what's he doing? Just, uh, well, he's doing what we're all doing. We're staying home most of the time. All right. That's, so it's easy. What are you doing now? What you're doing. Uh, except when we're allowed to, uh, to get out. Don't we all hope that this gets back to normal soon? Yeah. Uh, we should make vaccines the, like, the, if not the, well, that wouldn't be person of the year. That would be. I'll give you yours right now. Yeah, you, you got yeah, good. Jim's made vaccines down in our restoration area. You first. Uh, so anyway, the International Air and Space Hall of Fame, 59th museum anniversary since 1961 with the museum opening on this uh, back in 1963. Tonight, adhering to our tradition, we established just three years ago. Please join us as we celebrate America. During all these challenges and then some, who knew we'd face all these challenges this year? Um, challenges we face as a nation, coming together as people, no matter what race, creed, or religion. Yes, indeed, that overused slogan, we're all in this together. Yeah, whether we like it or not, we are, and we're going to get through it. So, as we've been doing in recent years, it's our moment to celebrate the greatness of the United States of America together. And at the same moment, and you know what? Everybody's going to sing. And we're not going to worry about you keep your droplets to yourself. We can sing. We'll do, we'll do this virtually. All right. You can sing in your own homes if you're watching this, wherever you happen to be. So please stand, sing the national anthem with me, with us right now here at the Air and Space Museum. And thank you for joining us. There's a lot more to come. And yes, we'll have fun too.
everybody sang beautifully. Jim was a little off, but that's but it's all from your heart and ours. As we do every year here at the Hall of Fame event, we acknowledge our service members who can't be with us tonight, especially during this recent time of international upheaval and unrest on a lot of levels. Remember them, and most of all, remember our prisoners of war and missing in action, lest we forget. Good evening. As we gather here tonight in this marvelous setting to celebrate new legends of flight, let us also be ever mindful that the sweetness of peace has always been tainted by the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are others who have endured and may still be enduring the agonies of pain, deprivation, and internment. Before we begin the festivities, please direct your attention to this small table, which occupies a place of honor here on the stage. It is here to honor and symbolize those who are missing from our ranks. They are referred to as prisoners of war and those missing in action. We call them comrades. The table is round to show our unending concern for our missing comrades. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their motives when they answered the call to their nation's duty. The single red rose displayed in a vase reminds us all of each missing life and their loved ones and friends who keep the faith awaiting answers. The yellow ribbon tied to the vase is symbolic of the thousands of yellow ribbons that were worn by those awaiting and the return of their loved ones and who continue to demand with unyielding determination a proper accounting of our comrades who are not among us tonight. The table is set for one. That and the lone candle symbolize the frailty of a prisoner enduring all alone, trying to stand up against his or her oppressors. A slice of lemon on the bread plate reminds us of the bitter fate of those captured and missing in foreign lands. A pinch of salt on the plate symbolizes the tears of their loved ones who still endure their absence and seek their return. The glass is empty and inverted, symbolizing their inability to share this evening's toasts and celebration with us. The chair is empty. They are not here. Please continue to remember America's prisoners of war and missing in action, and pray for the success of our continued national efforts to account for them. Thank you. Now, San Diego's contribution to the military is, well, it's endless. It's current. It's, uh, it's a major part of what we do here, all the branches, especially the Marines and the uh, and the Navy, and the Coast Guard, everybody, and uh, such a legacy throughout the years. And it's our San Diego legacy to defend our nation and support our warriors that we do. And that's reflected here in the museum. You go around, you see the various areas. You go back to 
the earliest days of flight, you go through the World War I section and, and World War II, and you see the P-51 Mustang, a salute to Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airmen out there. Uh, so much to see here, and it's not just, oh, here's some history, what it means for the future, what it means for our liberty. If there's one thing that I think all of us have been thinking about and, and clinging to, understandably, as we should, is liberty and freedom during these times of, you know, do this, don't do that, it's, uh, it's important. And all that heritage is the foundation to what we do. About the museum, um, we have two key metaphors that really, that really demonstrate what San Diego Air and Space Museum is all about. Uh, the practical application of STEM and innovation, you know, science, technology, engineering, math. Innovation is the story of great people, teams of people, organizations, excellence, and achievement. How much the Air and Space Museum means to our community? Well, a lot more than some people even know. Um, annual scholarships that we provide, the school and the park partnership with Price Charities, and of course this year when everything shut down in March and then we were open again and then shut down again and open because of all these changing, uh, what do they call them, uh, metrics, uh, they're hard for anybody to follow, but we just, you know, we've been doing everything we're supposed to be doing, but when we've had to be shut down, we would then go more online and we would still work the education department, all of this happening like we do in every normal year. School in the Park, a partnership with Price Charities. We have classes of kids with us daily in the museum, and when we're not able to do that because of the obvious, again, they've been online. We've been doing the distance learning. Inspiring, no matter what it takes, using technology. That's one of the things, as chairman here, that I'm really excited about is how Jim and the team have done such a great job. I, I love the fact that, that we haven't let anything keep this museum down. We haven't said, well, we got to close down, we'll just sit here and do nothing. It's been from day one, back in mid-March, let's work together for a safe reopening when we're allowed to be doing that. In the meantime, let's use every technology, every aspect we can have to keep this going as we do, keep everything protected and frankly safe here with all the proper protocols as well. Um, we'll talk about that tonight. You refer to some of the historical moments as we talk about our Hall of Fame um, award winners tonight. Think about it, just 117 years ago, December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers first flew at Kitty Hawk. 1911, Glenn Curtis sells the Navy their first airplane right here in San Diego, the home of naval aviation. 1927, Charles Lindbergh crosses the Atlantic solo in the San Diego Ryan aircraft built to uh, Spirit of St. Louis. The only true flying replica is right out here. It's got the DNA, as we like to say, because it was built by some of the same team members, the same place, same materials as, as Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis, the one that's in the Smithsonian. Um, the same place right here from Ryan uh, back in the day here in San Diego. Amelia Earhart crosses the Atlantic solo uh, five years to the day after Lindbergh in her Lockheed Vega. The airplane used in the Amelia movie about her story right here in the museum. That's in the museum. It's all about connecting the innovation, the technology, dots, the history, but it gets better. October 14th, 1947, Chuck Yeager, who for many years has been part of what we do here at the museum, he's been on this stage, he's in our Hall of Fame, Chuck Yeager, October 14th, 1947, breaks the sound barrier. No small feat in its day, taken for granted now, but that's big stuff. In San Diego's own, Bob Cardenas, later General Cardenas, flew the launch airplane, the B-29. And he's often here as well through the years with us. It's the story of people like that, the people who are here tonight, and, and so many of our Hall of Fame members are here in spirit. I can almost imagine that they're out here now. I think you can too. You may imagine you're here. If you've been here a lot of times, you can feel what it's like to be here. It's just quieter right now, but that's okay. So all of this matters because it positively impacts our lives, those of our kids, and so it's not just about a museum. It's not just about saying, oh, here's some history and let's give awards or whatever. It's about keeping going, keeping building, making things interesting and important and crucial in the, uh, the years ahead. Very easy to let all those skills atrophy this year. We're not doing that here with your help. We appreciate those who've been doing so much to, to keep us going, keep donating, because we, you know, we can't open the doors for so long for regular admission, uh, you know, we're not getting giant grants, we don't get any from, from the federal government, any of that kind of thing. So here we are uh, trying to do what we do all the time with all the parameters and, and yes, we will get through that as well. Let's remember, uh, we're as much about the future as we are the past, our future next generations. We have to believe, we talk about this often here, that it, there's not just one greatest generation, that was great during World War II. 
there are others to come. Right now, let's remember some who aren't with us anymore, but never forgotten. Okay, VIP is tonight. I can see them here. I can see them in my mind's eye. It's like Christmas vacation. Clark, I can see the lights twinkling. I see them twinkling out here. Uh, and I'll tell you this, there are VIPs watching. Many of you are in two places at one time. You're here with us and you're at home on the couch, drinking cocoa, possibly scratching. We don't know what you're doing. In fact, please don't take pictures. We're, we're just all in <laughs> this together. So. Let's see, we have many of our Living Hall of Famers here with us tonight, making this even more special. That's one of the things we love during all the normal years. People show up and they bring their medallions. And when you're here in the room with us, um, jam-packed with 800 people, um, you'll turn to the person to your right or left, and all of a sudden, there's a Hall of Famer. There's somebody who made and is making aviation and space history. Um, Bill Anders, Apollo 8, that, that famous, that was Christmas 1968, that famous... Earthrise photo. 
Um, he's there with Jim Lovell and Frank Borman in Apollo 8. Jerry Griffin, back in Mission Control. Milt Windler, Glenn Lunny, all their Gene Kranz. Mission Control, the, the backbone. You watch Mission Control, the movie, and you see that's the unsung heroes of Apollo. This is the 48th anniversary this month of Apollo 17. The most recent, I'll never say last, the most recent American mission to the moon. And there'll be a lot more to come. With a lot of new interesting mixes, whether it's SpaceX or whatever. We do know this. It's not a race with the, with the Russians this time, but the Chinese are filling the bill. And they've even had some uh, leaps ahead uh, with, with some unmanned uh, landing activity this month. I mentioned Bob Cardenas, General Cardenas, who is, who is ageless and timeless. Uh, he'll be here long after some of us are gone, I think. He'll, Bob will be here. Jim and I will be below the sod. And I'm not, not together. I don't mean nothing weird. But Bob, Bob Cardenas will be here eulogizing us. And he'll be 150 years old at that point. We love that about Bob. Uh, he is a, they're all national treasures. Fred Hayes, Apollo 13. One of the things I did during my COVIDian uh, uh, term this year, as you all have, you start trying to find out what you can do. In, in radio and TV, I'm in an essential business. We have essential business learning here. As flying is essential. So I finally, after years of ridicule from Mr. Kidrick, got my private pilot's license. So I will post. That's how what many, I did. How many hours? How May 20th. Hours? I was at three, 305, 310 hours right now, Jim. Thanks. Joe Graham said, take your time. So I did. But Fred Hayes heckles me on Facebook. I, I post a thing and he'll, he and Charlie Duke, Apollo 16. It's an honor to have people like them heckle just because they love it. They love aviation. And I'll tell you what, kids come to this museum and all of a sudden kids go, I want to fly. How do I do that? That's the point. That's the whole next generation. I'll tell you what, there's nothing more freeing when the state's in lockdown mode and all of that to get into an airplane and just go somewhere. I've been socially distancing at the 5,000 feet, 7,000 feet. If you ever thought about flying, I don't care how young or old or whatever, if you thought about learning how to fly, a lot of times we do ground school here at the museum as well. Start it. This is a great time to do the ground school work when you're at home saying, I can't go outside for whatever reason, whatever the, you know, the restrictions are. You know, explore what we have on our website, at the museum, and really, really enjoy that. Others that, uh, that join us here often, the Living Hall of Famers, Jim Lovell, I mentioned it for Apollo 8, also uh, back to Gemini, and uh, he was on Apollo 13, which gave Tom, uh, Tom Hanks a career, or vice versa. Um, a lot of people suddenly discovered the space, the whole space thing, and generations did with that movie. Ellen Ochoa was here a couple years ago, getting inducted to the Hall of Fame, San Diego native, and uh, talk about, you ran the Johnson Space Center for years. These people are no slouches. These people are, these are people who start just like, they're all kids once. By the way, that's a bulletin to some. They were all kids once. Kids saying, huh, I wonder if I do that. They did that. And if you're a kid watching this or somebody telling you about it later, you can do that too. Dave Scott, the astronaut. There's also Dave Scott at KUSI, who I don't believe has been on the moon, but I know that he's, has he? You know, he's, he's covered the moon. He does his world of wonder. World of wonder, so he can imagine that he's on the moon. But, but the real Dave Scott, uh, Apollo 9, which we have right out here at the museum. Charlie Duke, I mentioned, Apollo 16. Peggy Whitson. Uh, another just phenomenal NASA astronaut, Rusty Schweikert from Apollo 9, uh, Jim McDivitt from not only Apollo 9, but the Gemini program as well, Buzz Aldrin, uh, Harry Robertson, Patty Wagstaff, Joan Garrett, Gary Dyson representing Orbis, Diz Laird, 98 years old, the only Navy pilot to score shoot downs in Europe and the Pacific, both in World War II, flew from the decks of 12, count them, one, two, three, 12 aircraft carriers and has the highest number of straight deck aircraft carrier landings of any living Navy pilot. This is great. He's a great friend of the museum. And every time I read exactly, I get, I get goosebumps talking about him. More straight deck aircraft carrier landings of any living Navy pilot, even more than Kidrick had. It's an amazing. Thing. He's also Navy ace. And that's something. Diz flew in the Navy's very first jet squadron. He flew the first jet aboard the Midway. Janice McKinnon here, representing her late husband, Dan. Pam Chana, representing Bill Chana. Uh, Janet Westling, representing her dad, Dale Myers, who was, again, a big part of the museum, also inducted in recent years into the Hall of Fame. Uh, Marilyn and Don, we love you. Take good care. We, we miss seeing you as much. Um, 
thanks to our partners this evening. And they're stepping up even though we're doing this virtual kind of an event where, I'll tell you what, the catering is still great. I can smell it in my, in my that wouldn't be my mind's ear. I can just, ah, the entree was delicious tonight had we had it. That's good. And thanks to our partners this evening. We simply couldn't do what we do tonight without you. They're stepping up. Our partners are doing this as if we're having a regular, normal Hall of Fame event with you know, hundreds of people here. But as you're watching, you can step up and do that too. You can give. There are ways to help us in a variety of ways through the course of uh, the rest of this year to set us on a, a stronger footing. And we could use that going into next year. As, as good as we've been with Jim and with the team here, and we've been very fiscally prudent on all levels. None of us, just like in the rest of the world around us, ever forecast COVID coming this year. But in spite of that, being smart about it, we're spending money wisely. So when you give to support us, like our underwriters tonight, that's made a very big, big difference. And uh, we really appreciate it more than ever. Thanks tonight to our presenting sponsors, JT4 and their senior vice president, Dan Wild. And a lot of these are not necessarily, uh, you know, some, I guess some of these are in alphabetical uh, order. Uh, Ken Allen. Uh, Bill and Valerie Anders, Raymond uh, Apodaca, Blue Origin Management, LLC, Boeing Company, uh, Robert and Linda Bradley, Charles and Renee Brandis, Malin Burnham, Lee and Sue Cargill, uh, Roger and Alice Casper, the Charles Stout Foundation, Vance and Arlene Kaufman, Jeffrey Cote, George Delafield, Hudson and Mary Drake, Charlie and Dottie Duke, Apollo 16, helping support this. Peter and Doris, uh, Pete and Doris Ellsworth, Ambry Riddle Aeronautical University, great partners with us. John and Martha Farron, Fox and Monica Benton Foundation. Toby Fuller, long involved in the museum over the years. The Fusino Foundation. Uh, Carl, uh, is it Gebert, Jim, is that right? I don't have the MC's, you know, assist here. So if I botch your name, and I should mention this earlier too, if you're a VIP, you're sitting there at home, turn to the person, imagine or otherwise next to you, and just introduce yourself. Would you do that? And then put out your name right. That'd be good. We appreciate that, that support as well. General Atomics, uh, so thanks so much for the continued support over your Buzz and Alice Gibbs. Uh, Robert and Kim Gilliland Jr. Again, great connections to history here. Google them, look them up. That's why uh, I think Al Gore created the internet for you. Steve and Jeannie Hammerslag. Edward and Don Hughes, Harvard Business School Club of San Diego. David Marshall, Heritage Architecture and Planning. The ISAT Foundation. Irwin and Joan Jacobs. Alan and Robbie Johnson. Terry and Kay Johnson. Morton Noni Jorgensen. I mentioned Dan Wild at Kaiser Permanente. He's at JT4 LLC. Kaiser Permanente, thank you for your support tonight. Look, look at these people and these organizations stepping up. Even in these times, it would be easy to say, well, they're not having a dinner. I don't know, gonna, that means there's more money going to what we do here, and we really, really appreciate it again. Never so essential as now. Thanks as well to the Kenneth T. and Eileen L. Norris Foundation, uh, Sandy and John Landicho, who uh, was our, Sandy's been a longtime CFO, and she, well, she didn't really retire. She, she transferred to a new, but she's still, she's, she, she's, she's got our back, and uh, we're moving forward. She really helped get this museum into a great strong foundation, frankly, so we can weather what we've been going through this year. Not easy, but she and then Jim and the team have made that really uh, work marvelously. And we're so thankful, Sandy, for your service as well. Um, Dick LaRoe and his wife, Victory. Dorothea Laub, the law office of Miguel Leff in North Island and California Credit Union. And of course, uh, Robert and Allison Price, Price Charities. So thank you, all of you. But wait, there's more. You thought that was a great list. There are more sponsors making this happen. We don't want to go without uh, without a, a high five or, you know, knuckles or whatever we're allowed to do. Glenn and Marilyn Lunny, thank you. There's some history right there with, with Glenn at Michigan Droll. Again, Google him. Um, Marsh and McLennan Insurance Agency, LLC. Dr. Gay McDonald, John Merrill, Elizabeth Meyer, and Christopher Mikov, his son. Um, Steve Nico. The Parker Foundation, Rich and Jane Pickett, VJ and Ann Peroni, Price Philanthropies Foundation, John Randy Prime, Paul Reeves, Reuben H. Fleet Foundation Fund. Thanks as well to sponsors Harry and Linda Robertson, Ryan Family Charitable Foundation, SDG&E, 
They appreciate you running your Christmas lights in the spirit of the season a lot. So that, that does brighten things up. Some people put the Christmas lights up this year just because of COVID. I think like Memorial Day, just to say, can we get some more celebrations in here? Uh, put the lights on early. Thanks to Chuck and Amy Spielman, Tom and Cookie Sudbury, Michael Templeton, the Distinguished Flying Cross Society, the Harbaugh Foundation, San Diego Foundation, Patty Wagstaff, one of our Hall of Famers, uh, Norm and Grace Walker, Walter J. and Betty Zabel Foundation, Andrew Dumpke and the Wattis Dumpke Foundation, Janet and Mike Westling, and Arthur Wolk and his orchestra, which we appreciate. So there it is. At any rate, thanks to that is a great list of sponsors and a lot of a lot of new ones in the mix too that really stepped up uh, when Jim made a call. Jim makes a lot of calls at like three in the morning, kind of like like Dick LaRoe does when he's doing the golf tournament. Are you sponsoring a hole? Dick, it's 3 a.m. But will you sponsor a hole and I'll stop calling? Yes, because it's for the museum. The That's right. The grinder. The grinder who can call when you least expect it. So I mean, he's, he's steadfast and focused. Let's introduce our San Diego Air and Space Museum Board of Directors members. And uh, they're here virtually. I, I can't even imagine how some of them are probably now in their jammies watching this. So yes, as a group, I want you to all stand up and wave if you would. They're fantastic. Great job, all of you. I can applaud you. You can hear the crowds. Applaud yourselves. Now get back to work and wash your hands and sing happy birthday twice. All the protocols. Yeah, I see Hammer. There's Martin and Hudson and Jim, Jeff, Tyson, Evie, Mort, Alan and Alan. Alan and Alan, they're both there. Uh, Charles, Brian, Peter, Hudson, Andrew. Who else? John, Martin, Buzz, Rob, Grayson, Mike. David, this is like a really expanded Brady Bunch edition from back in the day. Edward, Brian, Victoria, Dick, Perry, Dylan, Corky, Rich, Ramin, Robert, Denny, Ivor, Chuck, Suds, Caleb, Michael, uh, Shuba, and then uh, Norm. And I think that's, if we missed you, we missed you. We miss all of you because we've been, we haven't had the board meetings in person. But thank goodness for Zoom. Thanks again to our staff, our events team, Melissa, Cassandra, Sandy, Kelly, Kevin, Katrina, Melissa, Debbie, our other Kelly, Diane, David, Rachel, and many others. And a special thanks to Denise and her Continental Catering team, the great VIP boxes that uh, you know are great. And they, they do a phenomenal job. And uh, Ruben Gallart, our technologies uh, director, the interactive uh, tech guy who's behind the cameras here and just does so much that you, you, you when you're at the museum, you take it for granted, you experience it. We never take them for granted, and we really appreciate Ruben's great work here as well. So on to the show now. Tonight, we've assembled to honor the world's best to introduce the importance of what we're doing tonight, honoring those people, organizations, programs, which change lives and make our world just a little bit better. Now, please join us as we watch some very special stories. Everything we've prepared for the last few months leads up to what you're going to experience in the next hour. So enjoy. And join us in honoring accomplishments which make us proud. So turn your attention to this next segment of the program. Since its inception in 1963, the International Air and Space Hall of Fame has honored over 200 of our world's most significant aviation pilots, crew, visionaries, inventors, aerospace engineers, public advocates and representatives, aerial photographers, designers, and space pioneers. They have been honored for their significant contributions to the advancement of mankind in the field of air and space. Those honored highlight the importance of technology and innovation and the endurance of man's adventurous exploring spirit to accept great risk in the pursuit of increased knowledge and advancement for the benefit of mankind. They are also men and women who truly believe in the pioneering spirit and are willing to make a difference. The International Hall of Fame is the most prestigious in the world and honors those many great who through history have made a positive difference and whose contributions are worthy of special recognition. To visitors from around the world this evening, Welcome to the International Air and Space Hall of Fame celebration, and thank you for coming.
So this is what it's all about. And by the way, we've just taken to another venue here in the museum. This is the Zabel Theater. And uh, this is the 3D, 4D experience, the first of its kind in the park. We love this. If you've been here, you know what we're talking about. If not, when we get back to being able to be open, you'll love this again. There's always something new playing here. And we're going to uh, show you the, uh, the honorees tonight in a special way here. It's kind of fun, even these virtual times, Jim, to be able to do this and, and take you in different places. We prefer being in the big room with everybody, but, uh, but this works. And we do not want to ignore honorees. That's why we're here tonight. So right now, I want you to look along, watch along with me here as we introduce our first honoree tonight. Ambitious, determined, unequaled perseverance, faith. A skilled naval aviator, airline pilot, a documented track record of patience and confidence in the cockpit. Calm, a truly composed leader in the air, a compassionate friend and co-worker. She never met a challenge too hard, from bullies on the school bus, discrimination in the workplace, or a catastrophic engine failure resulting in a dual flight emergency. Overcoming adversity is her middle name. She is Tammy Jo Schultz, former naval aviator and retired Southwest Airlines captain. Raised on a succession of farms in Colorado and New Mexico, Tammy Jo worked hard, daily farm chores, school, playing the piano, and exploring the outdoors with her brother. The family farm was located just north of Holloman Air Force Base, close enough for her to be mesmerized by jet fighters dogfighting overhead her home. As a young teenager, she knew that's what she wanted to do, become a military jet pilot. But farm work was hard work. She learned many life lessons early. Thrown from horses, pushed by hogs, watching runt piglets struggle, she learned early life isn't always fair. Even school confirmed her views. Teasing, bullies, but her parents wisely guided her. If you see injustice and do nothing to stop it, you're part of the problem. Silence is consent. Even career day at her high school confirmed for her there were many challenges to overcome. When she attended an aviation career lecture by an Air Force colonel, she was quickly dismissed as a female. Girls don't fly for a living, and this is a career day, not hobby day. You might want to find something you can do. Accepted into the Navy's flight training program, she felt routinely bombarded with naysayers, trials, and discrimination. But Tammy Jo tirelessly pressed on. From primary flight training, the T-34 Turbo Mentor, intermediate jet in the T-2 Buckeye, through advanced jet training in the TA-4 Skyhawk, formation flying, carrier landings, out-of-control flight, weapons training, and air combat maneuvering. She was consistently in the top of her class. It still wasn't uncommon for her to encounter someone who didn't want to see her there. But Tammy Jo persevered, even when her practice bombs were painted pink during her first air-to-ground weapons training. She knew always her forthright, disciplined approach to flying would win out, no matter the hard work required to rightfully earn assignments. She knew it was important to achieve, no matter the outright barrier she had to overcome as a woman tactical jet pilot. Quitting was never an option. She knew her achievements paved the way for others who would follow. She eventually earned her wings of gold and became one of the first female. FA-18 Hornet pilots in the United States Navy, also qualifying in the A-7 Corsair. Tammy Jo was twice awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal and a National Defense Service Medal. Her first aviation job out of the Navy, Tammy Jo fought forest fires in California with Serve Air. It was just a bridge to her goal to fly with Southwest Airlines, earning her 737 type rating. But here, too, she encountered some of the same challenges she faced in the Navy. However, she remained steadfast, knowing the values of Southwest aligned with her own, and it was a great company to fly for. Tammy Jo understood her importance to the future of commercial and airline aviation. Female pilots comprised less than 3% of Southwest pilots at the time. She was confident in the institution and vowed to be a change agent, a leader in the cockpit, and an example for others to emulate. 
male and female. Her husband and true partner, Dean, was eventually hired at Southwest Airlines as well. They lived in Texas and raised two children, instilling values of hard work, patience, compassion, and faith. She and her husband were deeply involved in their children's lives. She even coached her son's track and field team. In fact, it was a need to be home for a Saturday track meet, which necessitated Tammy Joe's switching a trip with Dean. Flight 1380, it was. On the morning of April 17, 2018, Tammy Joe's crew briefing was normal. She always made an effort for her briefings to be a dialogue, not a monologue. To her, leadership sets the tone, positive or negative. It was these conversations which formed the crucial bond of trust within just a few minutes when a crew meets before the flight. Trust to her meant discipline. Discipline you never expected to execute, but if required, it translated into teamwork and excellence. Just 20 minutes into Flight 1380, disaster struck when Tammy Jo and her co-pilot Darren felt a severe jolt. Initially, she thought midair. The cockpit filled with smoke and the 737 shook violently. The passenger liner rolled steeply to the left as they watched the left engine instruments flash. From their perspective in the cockpit, the situation turned really bad, really quick. Tammy Jo quickly recalled her out-of-control flight instructor experience, remained calm, and immediately began emergency procedures. Tammy Jo and Darren regained control of the aircraft, and it was classically aviate, navigate, and communicate. An emergency landing was to follow. The mechanical failures were many. A piece of a turbine fan blade dislodged and caused catastrophic engine damage. Hydraulic lines and a fuel line were cut off, and a piece of debris hit the window at row 14, causing it to blow out. Rapid depressurization was next. When able, Tammy Jo calmly transmitted a message of hope to her passengers and crew. We are not going down. We are going to Philly. Later, she learned her message was well-received by the cabin crew and passengers. She stated, though the words didn't change the circumstances, terror was replaced with possibility. They touched down in Philadelphia 20 minutes after the initial explosion. The medical emergency was quickly attended to by paramedics on the ground, and Tammy Jo watched in amazement as the cabin crew, debris strewn in their windblown hair, selflessly served water to the passengers. Tammy Jo continued her careful leadership, assisting passengers with their bags and treating them as she would want her family treated after such an accident. But her mind is special, and she never forgot the passenger who wasn't okay. Tammy Jo returned to the cockpit less than a month after the incident. Her experiences throughout her life prepared her for her return to the cockpit, and she was confident in her ability to move past adversity. Tammy Jo credits three things for the success of landing Flight 1380. The good habits of herself and her crew, the importance of hope, and the meaning of heroism. Hope does not change circumstances, but it changes attitude. A hero is someone who is caring and intuitively takes the time to act on behalf of someone else. For her trailblazing efforts on behalf of women aviators everywhere, both in military service and civilian aviation, as an accomplished U.S. Navy fighter pilot and Southwest Airlines captain, for her unwavering confidence in humanity, for her piloting skills, calmness under the most challenging of emergency conditions, and on behalf of 147 passengers saved by her heroic actions, leadership excellence, and sheer guts. The San Diego Air and Space Museum takes great pride in inducting Tammy Jo Schultz into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. How about that? That's good stuff. So listen, Tammy Jo, if you were here with us in person tonight with your husband, Dean, we'd be hanging the medal around you. Everybody congratulate you. We have the medal for you. It'll just be like being here. And we'll see you here next year. Let's visit more with Tammy Jo Schultz.
Well, congratulations, Tammy Jo. Uh, it's uh, certainly our pleasure to induct you into the uh, International Air and Space Hall of Fame. You can pretend I'm putting the medal on you. I've got one in my hand just like that. And you can show that you've got yours and uh, that we put it around your neck. Uh, and it, uh, it looks uh, uh, extremely attractive. So uh, this would be your chance to maybe start out uh, our dialogue. Uh, I've got a few really great questions for you this evening, uh, but uh, maybe you want to say something to, uh, to the viewers. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to join you, Jim. And I am humbled by the induction into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. I would have to say, whether it's an industry, a company, an airplane, or an individual, none of us launch from a foundation that we were the sole person that created it. And I certainly had a great foundation to launch into aviation from, uh, beginning with my folks uh, who taught me at an early age how what, what a joy there is in hard work and the thrill of problem solving. And then in the Navy, I was uh, fortunate to have Rick Coston, Captain United States Marine Corps as my on wing. And he was just a consummate aviator, gentleman and officer. So the bar was set high from the very beginning. And I went on to have a great T2 commanding officer, Captain Fred Grant, who uh, just made going through as the lone female invisible to me, uh, just treated everybody the same. And a good leader makes everyone focus on the mission at hand. So that was, which was flying, and that was fun enough. Um, I had Captain Rosemary Mariner as- Well, we're gonna, we're gonna talk to you about her. And that's really our first question. Okay. okay. So maybe this is a good segue into that. Uh, and certainly uh, your consideration as your mentor uh, for her uh, was, a, and, and certainly we compliment her for that. What was it that you admired in her which guided your career? And what advice would you give to young girls who aspire to become engineers, pilots, or even astronauts? Yeah, well, uh, Captain Mariner, Rosemary Mariner, she was in the first class of women in the Navy. And the Navy was the first branch of the military that opened up to women earning their wings. And then she was my commanding officer. And when she was my commanding officer, I certainly had a great uh, example set for me. It wasn't until she went on and we kept in touch that she really became quite a mentor and friend in helping me navigate some of the kind of new territory that I was going through in aviation, both in the Navy and then in commercial airlines as well. And um, one of the things that I would tell young ladies as, as you're thinking about what you want to do in life is first of all, the things that you're interested in right now, keep doing them don't feel like you need to start uh, narrowing your field down to aviation or engineering or anything like that along the way. It's all the different things that you do growing up that make you such a rich person in what you bring to the cockpit, to uh, the office, to whatever you do. And um, so if you enjoy uh, singing or band or drama, cheerleading, uh, all the things that you enjoy, they have facets that really uh, fold well into any kind of STEM program. And here's another point. STEM is not the only input to being aviators. I, I have to say, STEAM, add arts into STEM and you have STEAM. And that's honestly a better, um, a better platform to think about coming from. And so I would encourage you, whatever you're interested in, uh, keep going in that direction. Well, that's great. So, you know, after you left the Navy, you know, what drove some of your future uh, career decisions? You know, serve air, uh, Southwest Airlines and the challenges of raising a family. Yeah, well, one thing that I've, I've 
learned early in life is when what you want to do isn't available, don't sit back and wait, go do something else. And it's so often that when you think, oh, this isn't what I, what I wanted to do, but it's all that's available, dig in and go do it. Um, I hadn't planned on flying over forest fires. I had wanted to get my type rating and be ready to jump into commercial aviation when I left the Navy, but it just wasn't, that wasn't the way it folded, unfolded. I couldn't get into an ATP class. I had a hard time getting a hold of the people I needed to, to get finished getting my type rating. And so I wound up flying over forest fires for a summer. And that was, that was not only fun, it was great experience and in a cockpit very uh, and doing a mission very unlike anything else that i'd ever done so i think uh, i think the more experiences we have the uh, kind of the richer we are whenever we we go to our next next job uh, or profession and then uh flying commercially and raising a family i would have to say um in that lineage of people that i owe uh, so much to, it would be the Renaissance man, Captain Dean Schultz, my husband. And it's really because of him that I could embrace both a, a profession and being a, a full-time mom, both of which were lifelong dreams. So uh, that would be one of the things I would say about whenever you have those, those uh, goals in life, that the choices you make, like who you marry and things like that, will will have a big, big bearing on how how well you do, how far you go in those. Well, I think that alone is a great lesson. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your leadership philosophies. You you know you write in your book so much about positive leadership, negative leadership, uh, your hard work on the farm, uh, and the wonderful parents that you had. And tell us a little bit about at the end of that. Herb Kelleher's impact on you and Southwest Airlines? Well, leadership style, I think uh, there's a lot of different styles, but one of the overarching things that I've found in leadership, both in my folks and in scripture, uh, is servant leadership. And that is setting it, setting an example and making sure that the people around you have what they need to do their job. Uh, making sure that you're not the focus of, of the job. Uh, the real, I think a real leader is, just makes it a seamless event for making sure everyone has what they need to, to get it done and making sure that the accolades are spread around. And Herb Kelleher, I would say, had a great way of, of leading. I think he was very much uh, a servant style leader and he he went to great lengths to uh, make sure that his employees knew they were appreciated and one of the things I've always admired about Southwest is how they rate their internal customers which are employees just as highly as they rate their external customers which are passengers and so Treating our, our team, our crew, importance, uh, treating them with importance first, I think that springboards, uh, that gives them a springboard to treat passengers and customers well. When, when, we're, when we're treated well, it's easier for us to pass that on. Well, that's great. In your book, you refer to the importance of personal and professional perseverance. Tell us more. Well, one of the things I would like to say uh, on the front cover, there was a word that the, the a publisher and I argued over for months, and that was the word dreams, because I feel like it's a little bit of a wispy, wispy word. And I think we need more than dreams to help us persevere through some of the tempests and storms or maybe the lulls in life. And I think, I think dreams are just a starting pistol. I think it's the race ahead, the years of hard work that put us in the place that we need to be uh, to meet those challenges. 
whenever they come across our path. So perseverance is, is one of those things that needs something more than dreams to draw on. Okay, the emergency, flight 1380. Certainly a wow in the career of any trained pilot. In your words, talk us through that day and the lessons you'd previously learned and applied that day. Well, uh, I'm going to just kind of start airborne, really, uh, because there are a number of lessons going backwards on the ground that would take a little longer. But uh, airborne, right when we were passing 32,600 feet, uh, we heard an explosion and felt like we'd been T-boned by a Mack truck. Uh, we pitched, we pitched over, nose over, skidded sideways and did a snap roll all instantaneously. And Darren and I comparing notes a few weeks later, we both thought we'd been struck by another aircraft. It was so sudden and so violent. And having been pulled out of the lineup to teach guns in T2s as a um, advanced instructor by a new commanding officer that was open about his dismay at inheriting a female instructor. So I was sent to teach out of control flight for a year. It was a punishment, very obviously, very publicly done. Nobody liked flying those flights. But that would be some of my best training in the Navy, both for, uh, it served me well as an aggressor pilot, my next assignment, but certainly as a Boeing pilot that day. During that year of teaching out of control flight, one flight, there had been a, a mechanical malfunction and our fuel had, had drained, uh, been used asymmetrically. And instead of doing a simple stall, we did a snap roll, <laughs> a snap into a spiral. And we didn't have any procedures in the T2 NATOPS to get out of a spiral. And so it was, um, it was, a very quick ride down to what I anticipated being an ejection that worked out and we flew out right above the eject altitude. But having had something go very wrong before and being used to handling aircraft that were completely out of control and then getting them back into control, that, uh, that would be probably a very pivotal bit of training in that came into use that day in flight 1380. There would be uh, a continuing uh, unscripted combination of emergencies all the way down because the explosion that caused uh, chunks to be torn out of the leading edge of our wing, the side of the fuselage, the tail, it also had peeled the engine cowling back, which a little bit like a banana peeling, but remaining attached and flailing in 500 mile an hour wind. Nothing stayed the same. We never had the same shutter twice. Uh, it always changed. So the same, there was never the same amount of rudder or aileron use that worked. And you change the airspeed and of course that changes everything. And you change the airspeed and that changes the rudder authority. And so we, we just dealt with an, a number of things besides just the physiological events, having had a rapid depressurization and um, the things that I thought were interesting getting to look back at that day were the amount of true stories, some of them not even aviation related, but I've always loved uh, reading fic uh, nonfiction, true stories. And there were so many little snapshots on the way down of, for instance, uh, when Darren and I could not communicate because of the roar and the smoke and the shuddering. And I just remembered that Air France uh, flight where two people were putting in opposite control inputs to the same aircraft and it didn't end well. And I. Uh, so I made sure that Darren and I were able to communicate, even if it was hand signals, and then not getting too tied up in checklists when what we really needed to do was focus on aviating, <laughs> navigating, and uh, sometimes communicating, but sometimes our aviate, navigate, communicate, cycle back to aviate, 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 and realizing 
remembering that Swiss Air flight that got so tied up in dealing with checklists and burning off fuel because they had a fire that they wound up running out of fuel and crashing overhead an airport um, or near an airport because they, they allowed themselves not to uh, keep situational awareness and uh, prioritize, constantly reprioritize. And so there were just these little true stories that came to help make a snap decision on the way down. And then after landing and realizing um, more of what had happened in the back of the aircraft and that right after Darren and I got our headsets back on and our, our oxygen masks on and could communicate. I, I made a quick PA, not thinking that really very many people would hear it, but knowing how startling it had been for Darren and I, I made a PA uh, because I thought it had to be mind numbing for those in the back. And I, I told them, we're not going down, we're going into Philly and got back to flying with Darren. But hearing that message, a destination, which gave them a hope, the flight attendants unbuckled and started down, got on their feet, started down the aisle to help people. There were passengers that unbuckled and left the relative safety of their seat and went towards an open window that had blown out, been damaged and blown out. And that was a very dangerous section of the airplane, but they went there to help uh, another passenger, a stranger. And so when the day was done, I have to say, it was the human element that really um, impressed me. And my takeaway from that day is, is threefold. Habits, hope, and heroes. Habits on a good day become our instinct on a bad day. And we have this generous gift of choice in what we choose to groom our habits and thus instincts into. I, I think it's a reminder also that we have a birthright to think for ourselves. And then hope. Um, I realized that day that hope doesn't always change your circumstances. It didn't change ours for the next 22 minutes, but it did change us. For Darren and I, when we found Philly and got control of the aircraft, we just started problem solving backwards from where we wanted to be to where we were and readjusted along the way. For the flight attendants, it put them on their feet and headed back to reassure people that we were headed into Philly, getting their, helping them with their oxygen masks. Passengers, Tim McGinty, Andrew Needham, Peggy Phillips, joined my flight attendants, Catherine Sandoval, Shanique Mallory, and um, Catherine, excuse me, Rachel Fernheimer. And so uh, hope changes us. And then heroes, I saw so many that day and many of them did not have any equipment, any title or any uniform. They were simply people who took the time to see and the effort to act on behalf of someone else. And I realized at the end of that day that those people probably were not heroic that day for the first time. I think they made a habit of giving hope to others. Well, that's a that's a it's a great story. I mean, it's just wonderful. Uh, every report we have, especially uh, you know, in the book, says that voice communication you made to the passengers was maybe everything. Yeah, because it did give that hope, and that's what people need at that uh, at that critical time. Um, okay, so as we start to close this, um, anything else? This is your forum. Uh, we have a wonderful. Uh, a viewership who's just uh, thrilled about your induction into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. And this is kind of your chance to talk to them. Well, I would like to, I would like to leave with this. Um, Amelia Earhart said, adventure is worthwhile. And I would have to add to it and say, I think we were made for it. And this year in 2020, I think there's been a lot of adversity in, in our path. And adversity, though never welcome, uh, I do think adversity is exactly what grooms us, sometimes chisels and forges us to face even bigger challenges ahead. 
And it's the adventure that inspires us to take those challenges on. And I would just like to wish you blessings in your adventures ahead. Well, blessings back to you. So <laughs> thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, congratulations uh, once again. I'll give you the, uh, the, the clap, but you can pretend everybody else is clapping with me at this moment. And we truly, truly thank you for joining us this evening. And um, uh, uh, you earned it. How's that? Well, you, you thrilled me. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. And what's nice is it's a short list of honorees, each of them very significant. And we are so proud to be able to do this tonight. Please watch now our next and final honoree video. A consummate professional, driven, high achiever, an exploring personality by nature. She's a respected attorney, diplomat, cattle and bison rancher, businesswoman, politician, and an instrument rated pilot, a certified astronaut, an adventurer by nature, her goals to excel at whatever she takes on ensures only the best results. She's respected by anyone who encounters her. She leads over 650,000 men and women, active duty, guard, reserve, and civilian airmen and their families, including the fledgling U.S. Space Force. She is the Honorable Barbara McConnell Barrett, 25th Secretary of the United States Air Force. Barbara was born December 26, 1950, on a farm in Indiana County, Pennsylvania. Times were challenging then in the region. Her father was a factory worker and a struggling subsistence farmer. However, Barbara quickly grew older than her years. At 10, she could drive a car, milk a cow, shoe, saddle, and feed the family's 24 horses, and by 12, she was a trail ride guide. But growing up, she believed girls basically were provided three career choices, teacher, secretary, or nurse. When she told her father she wanted to be a nurse, he challenged her. Why not a doctor, he said. For Barb, this was a breakaway moment. And ever since, she routinely asks herself, why not this or this? Her father's dream was to ultimately take his family to Arizona, where he'd been a cowboy years before. However, he passed before they could move. Barbara was to fulfill her father's dream, leaving the farm for college in Arizona, earning her bachelor's, master's, and law degrees at Arizona State University by 1978. It hasn't stopped there. Honorary doctorate degrees from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Thunderbird School of Global Management, the University of South Carolina, Pepperdine University, and Finlandia University. Married to Craig Barrett for 35 years, the couple lives in Paradise Valley, Arizona. It was way back on July 20, 1979, after attending a board meeting in Phoenix and hiking up the old Squaw Peak, when she was sitting at the top watching the sunset and she heard footsteps of a gentleman walking up to her. They ended up hiking down together, the understated super couple in the making. Craig had simply told her he was a manager in a small electronics firm, and her thoughts were he was most likely the night clerk at a radio shack. Surprise, surprise. Craig was the general manager of Intel Corporation, later its chairman and CEO. Understated he was and is. Barbara Baird is a special kind of tenacious, completing astronaut training from Space Adventures when their CEO told her they had an unexpected and short lead time seat become available for a backup astronaut. Normally, a multi-year training program, her fitness, piloting experience, and aeronautical knowledge compressed her training to just four and a half months. For her, it was just like shoeing the horses at age 10, another check in the box. Barbara has always been about breaking barriers and to be the first in line. In light of a 1948 law, which mandated female military pilots could fly tankers and transports but not tactical aircraft in combat, she became the first woman to land in an F-18 Hornet on an aircraft carrier, the USS Nimitz, as a civilian advisor to the Secretary of Defense and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. She wanted to demonstrate firsthand women could be in the fight. 
she worked tirelessly to change the law and introduce women to combat aviation. In 2008, Barbara became U.S. Ambassador to Finland for the first time appreciating serving her nation on foreign soil. She felt the great responsibility firsthand and extended her positive impact by communicating not just with governmental representatives, but with the people of Finland. Her fondest memories include rounding up reindeer, dog sledding, downhill and cross-country skiing. The Finnish Air Force flies American F-18 Hornets, and she still recalls dogfighting against their Air Force chief of staff. It was a classic draw, true to her form and personal goals, to find just the right middle ground. Barbara distinguished herself in many senior leadership positions, in public service, the private sector, and in academia. Before the age of 30, she served as an executive with two global Fortune 500 companies, Deputy Administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration and President of the Thunderbird School of Global Management. She also taught leadership courses as a Harvard Fellow at the Kennedy School of Government, and prior to assuming her current position, she served as Chairman of the Board for the Aerospace Company. She leads the way. Barbara also served on the boards of Space Foundation, Sally Ride Science, the Center for International Private Enterprise, the Smithsonian Institution, Caltech, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Hershey Trust Company, the Mayo Clinic, the Lasker Foundation, Exponent Corporation, Raytheon, and Piper Aircraft. She's busy. And as president of the International Women's Forum from 1999, through 2001. In 2014, she was inducted into the Arizona Aviation Hall of Fame and received the Worcester Polytechnic Institute Presidential Medal. Speaking recently about the U.S. Space Force, Air Force Secretary Barrett praised its recent creation and believes it will propel America into a new era, dedicated to protecting U.S. national interests and security in space. She added, it is a critical capability in defending the nation and pledged the first new branch of the military service since 1947. It would be established with speed and clarity of purpose. Bringing the Space Force into reality has been a top priority for Secretary Barrett. She commented, the President and Congress gave us a job to do and we're moving out. With more than 40 countries spacefaring with satellites, probes, and sometimes human travelers, it's a space we must be in now and forever. The critical role space plays in everyday life, from transportation, commerce, communications, national security, and even farming, makes freedom to access and operate in space one of our highest priorities. Though Barbara notes there was initial skepticism by some, especially in Congress, our direction is more clear than ever. Educating the American public remains the service's primary goal to demystify its future. For her steadfast, dedicated, and focused lifestyle, aimed at achieving excellence in her personal and professional life, which has ensured her positive impact on America's national security, for her innate leadership style, optimizing the many functions of the United States Air Force, and mission awareness of America's new Space Force, the San Diego Air and Space Museum takes great pride in inducting Secretary of the United States Air Force Barbara McConnell Barrett into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. Great honorees, right? Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, Madam Secretary, if you were here with us in person tonight, Hudson Drake, Kerry Robertson, the gang at Embry Riddle Prescott would be hanging your medal around your neck and doing that with great love and respect, and uh, they really uh, congratulate you as we do. Let's visit more now with Secretary of the Air Force, Barrett. Well, thank you for joining us, okay, and congratulations on uh, being inducted into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. It's very well deserved. Now, I'm gonna go through this uh, uh, because we have some very special friends. So I'm gonna kind of pretend that I'm putting this around your neck, okay? Which you already have it, of course. And uh, this is from Hudson Drake, a very good friend of yours. Uh, Harry Robertson, 
and your friends at Embry Riddle in the uh, primarily the Prescott campus, and I uh, they have been just tremendously supportive of you as a candidate for the Hall of Fame, and uh, I just want to say welcome. And I have to say one other thing. In the course as a Navy pilot, I would say fly <laughs> Navy. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. so you're welcome to start out with us and your crowd is uh, listening to you well thank you very much san diego air and space museum thank you and congratulations on earning global respect for your incomparable collection of artifacts archives and innovations we applaud how you educate and entertain museum museum visitors physical or virtual and how you persevere and preserve America's aviation and aerospace heritage. Because of my longstanding respect for the San Diego Air and Space Museum, both as an Arizonan who has visited many times and as a former Smithsonian regent who appreciates the immense challenges of operating a museum complex, it is profoundly meaningful to me to be inducted into your renowned Hall of Fame. Victor Hugo wrote in Les Miserables, where the telescope ends, the microscope begins. Which of the two has the grander view, he asked. From subparticulate matter to black matter, human ingenuity is producing discoveries at an accelerating rate. In a year when COVID-19 vaccines went to trials in record setting time, researchers discovered the origins of phosphorus, an essential element for life. CERN researchers discovered a new particle, a tetraquark, and, six, and a 17-year-old NASA intern discovered a rare circumbinary planet. Similar to the US Air Force and the US Space Force are innovating on microscopic and cosmic scales. The US Air Force is on the move, building on the legacies of San Diego Air and Space Museum Hall of Famers like Bernoulli and Boeing, Borman, Branson, Bell, Beach, Bird, and Bezos. Airmen are expanding technological frontiers using artificial intelligence and hypersonics, microelectronics, advanced communications, and directed energy. As we approach the first anniversary of the US Space Force, we know how space enables navigation, information, and communication. The US Space Force is intent upon protecting free and open use of the ultimate high ground for US interests, those of our allies and any benevolent actors. What lies over the horizon is the question that drives the betterment of the human condition more than any other aspect of civilization. Right now, civilization's horizon is space. The human intellect is infused with an innate and unquenchable interest in and curiosity about science. Whether studying neurons or neutrinos, exploration will deepen our knowledge of the world around us. It'll inspire us to in examine the microscopic world It'll challenge us to explore the most distant expanses of the universe and resulting discoveries will, preserve, will be preserved, taught and exhibited at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Hudson Drake, Embry-Riddle, Harry Robinson, thank you for your cherished friendship and your thoughtfulness in nominating me for this extraordinary recognition. And Jim Kedrick, thank you for your leadership of a preeminent American gem. I'm profoundly grateful for this induction into your Hall of Fame. Thank you. Well, I'm going to tell you, you make me want to get a little bit younger because it sounds very exciting. I think the future is uh, is certainly everything you're you're discussing. Um, the San Diego International Air and Space Hall of Fame is dedicated, of course, as you said, to uh, teaching today's youth about air and space pioneers accomplishments and to inspiring youth to pursue careers in the air and space sciences. Can you tell us a little bit about what sparked your early interest in aviation and aerospace? Well, like so many young people, they, you always wonder what it would be like to fly. I had a father who was a great explorer and he took my brother and me when there were just the two of us as kids uh, to, to go on a flight. He didn't want us to be afraid. Well, it worked. I wasn't afraid. I loved it. And so my first exposure to flying was that little Piper Cub grass strip barn for a hangar uh, exploration. But then I heard about Neil Armstrong and saw that first step on the moon. And so it went from 
atmosphere to be outside of the atmosphere, thinking all the way to the moon and beyond. And then my own career ended up uh, taking me in that direction where I, where I was especially engaged in transportation. So I wrote the bill to create the Arizona Department of Transportation um, as, a, as an intern in the state legislature. And that evolved to being in the corporate world in transportation. And then uh, I was invited to be a part of the administration as vice chairman of the United States Civil Aeronautics Board, and then as number two at the FAA. So I spent time in the corporate world, in the government, and at the state level, as well as the federal level. But most of all, I had that personal interest in space. I became a pilot. I trained to go to space, qualified as an astronaut, and uh, again, continue to think about exploring and the the great exposure that you get from being just a little bit above the surface of the earth. Well, you certainly become one of our leaders and we appreciate that. So how your career path has guided you to serving in aerospace companies, uh, ultimately leading you to your current role, uh, serving as the 25th Secretary of the Air Force? Well, I would have never anticipated this transition, but uh, I, I consider it one of the greatest privileges to serve as the Secretary of the Air Force. You know, there are 695,000 men and women who work for the United States Air Force or the United States Space Force. And uh, to have the privilege of serving them as they serve our nation is, what, is the highest privilege I could ever imagine. So uh, being a part of the United States Air Force, the Department of the Air Force, and then standing up the Space Force has really been a privilege and a challenge through this time. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, uh, space exploration is uh, is on the move and the space economy is growing uh, with historic launches by NASA, the introduction of uh, significant commercial space efforts and the recent creation as you're uh, discussing the U.S. Space Force officially established under your leadership. So we got a two part question here. First, can you discuss the Space Force mission capabilities and accomplishments? Well, the United States Space Force has, uh, has a broad mission of protecting America, our interests, and our allies' interests, and those of any benevolent actor in space. Uh, and so it's everything from the mundane of uh, working to build an acquisition system that allows us to be fast in our acquisitions, to move at the speed of electrons rather than the speed of gears, uh, to uh, the truly sublime in things like the X-37B launches, having experiments on the X-37B and working in those technologies that I described that are uh, cutting edge and, and beyond the edge, beyond what we're able to do so far. The Space Force is both a a domain, a warfighting domain, uh, and uh, a, a something akin to a utility. It is the source from which the GPS system that governs so much of what we do, it is the domain in which that GPS system resides and therefore uh, needs to be protected. So we uh, have vulnerabilities in our space capabilities that Americans depend upon, and we need a space force to help to uh, ensure that they are protected. Well, GPS, as you said, it's just absolutely, it's magic and it's huge and it's, it's, it's something that's so user-friendly today and will only get better. Um, can you also explain the role of the Space Force in support of NASA and our commercial space initiatives? Space Force and NASA are partners. We work hand in hand. NASA is the primary civilian side of uh, the space activity and the Space Force is the defensive side. Uh, but we meet regularly with the, the Chief of Space Operations and I meet with the administrator at NASA and we coordinate much of what we do. Much of the science and the technology that we deal with NASA deals with also. So we coordinate our spending. We work together to um, plan some of our mission elements. When NASA is doing a launch, the Space Force is very much involved with the communications, with the airspace. Um, and so we're partners and we are working 
the weather on launches, the range management, uh, all of that is Air Force cooperating with NASA, Air Force and Space Force cooperating with NASA. Well, that's great. Um, you know, we have the uh, pandemic, the, the Department of the Air Force has taken a much larger role this year because of that in both medical responses and care, but also lifting the American spirit through dedicated flyovers, which uh, uh, we had a big one here in San Diego, as you recall, uh, with the Thunderbirds. Uh, can you share your experience of leading through these very challenging times? The well, United States Air Force and Space Force were called upon during these extraordinarily challenging times. When the, first, when the call first went out, when we had American citizens in Wuhan and they needed evacuated, who would they call? They called the Air Force. Where are we gonna put these people? Well, the first place to consider was a, a military base to house them in isolation so that when we didn't know the viral, how viral this uh, affliction was, we house people at an American base um, and we transported uh, the, all, a lot of the um, protection from potential danger was arranged by the United States Air Force. So uh, then lift, moving personal protective gear and swabs was partly handled by the United States Air Force. Uh, communication and, and information was very much a part of the Air Force responsibilities. But then that great flyover. So the evacuation, very mundane things again, evacuation, the transport, those things were part of the Air Force. But then when it came to lifting people's spirits and thanking those tireless um, uh, frontline providers of healthcare, the flyovers by the teaming up of the Air Force and the Navy with the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds going across many of the major cities of America and shown on televisions across our country and computer screens as well. Uh, that was a way of, of our Air Force and Space Force saying thank you to the American people. Well, your, your leadership has been uh, uh, recognized by many. And you know, from your perspective, define the resiliency you know, we need as a nation to succeed during this time. You know, we're facing a lot of challenges and we need to find hope wherever it can be. And so um, the United States Air Force, we provide a stabilizing environment. We provide, we, we transport and, and uh, provide lots of capabilities and space as well. It is through the Space Force that so much of our communications takes place. So when, when America's resilience is challenged, you know that you can count on the Air Force and the Space Force to deliver. So during the pandemic, again, the evacuees from China were housed at air bases, uh, quarantines or assisted by the air bases. We uh, assisted when the Navy ships were on the East Coast and West Coast and they needed additional bandwidth, the United States Air Force came in and helped to resolve some of those things. Uh, so both Mercy and Comfort were uh, the two ships, but Mercy and Comfort were also the substance of what the United States Airmen provided. So Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, all teamed up, including the space professionals, to build resilience for America in the face of this COVID-19 challenge. Well, yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> Okay, so for a moment, you know, circling back on the importance of education, which you stated uh, very early in the conversation, for the youth that might be tu tuning in with us, what's your advice to them as they look to pursue a career in aviation and or space, the future for them? Well, there are lots of opportunities in both the U.S. Air Force and in the Space Force, and it's an exciting time. What we've found is young people are excited about joining the United States Space Force. And also there is a greater recognition of what's happening in, in the Army, Navy, Air Force and Marines using space. So it's an exciting time to think about space and the space application to so much of what we do. We want to attract visionaries. We want to attract the explorers, the people who are the innate, uh, who have that innate desire for exploration. So we're looking to get the very best of talent. And of course, education 
is what prepares both air and space professionals for careers that would uh, help to build those systems. So air, aviation, aerospace engineering education would be helpful. Cyber is going to be key to anything that we're doing in the future. Intelligence is a great purpose that much of our space and air assets are used for. Acquisitions are essential in everything that we do. So having an understanding of engineering, if you're a part of the acquisitions team, uh, engineering is, is significant to that. And space operators, um, the, the, the underlying, I guess, the underlying issue would be if you're going to be involved in space, you need to be a lifelong learner because uh, whatever your education is today, nobody's prepared for what the demands are going to be of tomorrow or a decade from now. So it's the exploration, it's the discovery, the, the joy of discovery. That will be the kind of thing that will mark the people who should be a part of the air and space field in the future. Well, I think you're exactly right. That lifelong learner really fits. Well, we're going to say thank you very much. Um, uh, and really, congratulations again on your induction into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. We're thrilled to have you. Now you're part of the brethren here. So uh, uh, you're part of our fabric and our soul, uh, you know, at the Air and Space Museum, you know, with the Hall of Fame. Uh, you have many, many fans and uh, we, uh, we stand at the ready to assist you in any way you might need us in the future. Thank you so very much. I have to say it's the other way around. You have so very many fans and I am honored and thrilled to be a part of your team. Thanks so very much for the induction. Thank you very much, Barbara. My pleasure, thank you. Bye now. And thank you again, Madam Secretary and Jim. What an evening. And we're almost wrapped up. You may not be watching this during the evening. What a day. Morning, whenever you're watching this. A uh, couple of housekeeping notes here as we draw things to a close in just a bit. Regarding the beautiful portraits you see tonight, thanks again to Stan Stokes, who I think I see here somewhere. Stan? Stan? Stan's here. Stan does great work, and we appreciate it so much. Stand up and wave wherever you are, Stan. Probably back in his studio creating next year's. He already knows who he thinks who next year's inductees will be. Um, we're all about kids. Said that a lot tonight at this special event, our greatest generation. So please stay close with us as friends of what we do. We try to keep you informed. Go to the sdasm.org website, sadasm.org, San Diego Air and Space. Google us uh, in, on Facebook and you know, check all the images we have. You can take virtual tours of the museum. And when we open up in these crazy times, when we're Given the okay to open again, we're ready. We hit the ground running, thanks to Jim and the team, making sure that when, when it's green lighted, we're back in it with all the proper protocols, doing what we do best. So when we have those times and we, when we can open, we open up again, hopefully just stay open as normal, uh, sooner rather than later, support us. Even if it's little spurts of, you know, I know the governor calls it toggle back, toggle forward, or whatever. When, when it toggles back in the direction where you can be here, be here. We appreciate that so much. Inspiring young people is what we do. Having fun. It's about that you enter for fun. This place is fun. It's fun now, even though it's kind of quiet right now because of the circumstances, it's always fun. You walk around here, you get inspired. You can come in here in the crummiest mood you've ever had. And after about five minutes, you're in a whole different place. You're a kid again. Um, if you're a kid now, you're an adventurer. Um, by the way, it goes by quickly and then pretty soon you're not a kid. So take advantage of that when you can. So our goal is to inspire young people to excel in their lives, to pursue the sciences, technology, engineering, mathematics, innovation. The American product is intellectual capital. But the need to take risks and conquer the toughest challenges critical to our nation's success. Our Air and Space Museum is a metaphor for greatness. And just as we viewed things this evening, the greatness people and teams of people can achieve must be passed on. You can help us do that. As you know, Jim, Jim, would you walk back out and join me right here? Jim Kidrick from the other room. I will. Uh, from the Zabel Theater moments ago. So as you know, uh, we have a very special offer by a couple, two people who are devoted and special friends and so devoted. They're kind of like, don't, you don't have to mention us. We're just, we're just doing this. Um, they stepped up right in the middle of the first few months of this that we've been enduring. And, uh, they continue to positively impact our region and the nation. Uh, 
very well-known people, not going to mention them because uh, that's the way they, they like that. They've offered the museum a half a million dollar, for those of you playing along at home, that's a $500,000 challenge grant. Now, this is good through December 31st. 21 more days. It's ticking, ticking, ticking. So you have time days. to give and you're, you know, it's tax deductible too, so do that. And you're going to trigger more of an impact because of and there yeah, are and there's some, more. Well, there's special tax breaks yes. for this year, so don't miss out on those. Consult your tax that's professional, correct. won't you? And we have several involved with this year, as a matter of fact. So that's good through December 31st. Every dollar, you know, most of you know how grants work, and special matching grants. Every dollar we raise will trigger that. We raise half a million, we get the old, the whole rest of the half a million. Right. So, so we want to squeeze one, every... We have two. That's right. So give one, your impact is of two. You can't deduct the two, but you get the one, and it'll <laughs> trigger the other two. So don't, so don't... You know what I'm saying. This is not just an investment in what we do with education. This right now is an investment in our future, in our ability to meet the future as well. It, it translates even the most basic, like food for the employees, right, Jim? So... Well, it really yeah. does. And we were the only museum because of the competence of our team, uh, their their spirit, their willingness to... Uh, you know, to bear down at just the right time. When we closed on March 16th, we were the only museum to actually open on the first day any museum could open on June 12th. Yeah. We were, as you know, reclosed on July 7. Again, the only museum to open on August 31st, the first day we could. So this is a credit to the team here at the Air and Space Museum. Their resiliency through a very, very difficult time, your donations go to ensure they're with us and they're ready every day. And everybody on the team has stepped up. I mean, people have been just hungry to do what needs to be done. And like for all of you, it's not easy. That's where we are all in this together. But here for the museum, seeing the kind of inspiration, the dedication that people do when, you know, other places people might have said, okay, that's it, I'm done. But their dedication to what we do here is what keeps it going. But we need your help now to, to meet those needs, but at the same time to keep the museum ready for everything in the future to be able to weather it and stay strong. And right now, frankly, between now and the end of the month, remember every dollar you give is gonna unleash another dollar from that special matching grant. So make a difference, give and do the best you can as we're doing here every day. So thank you so much for your support and for being with us for this very special event. Next year, we'll all be back in here and there may be adult beverages too, so we'll all enjoy that. What you're doing at home is up to I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are here. So we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us. And join us again soon at the San Diego Air and Space Museum and online as well.